Welcome, everyone. Can you hear me? It's an honor and a privilege um, to be able to introduce Professor Terry Sanofsky tonight, one of the most important figures of recent decades in the fields of neuroscience and artificial intelligence. Professor Sanofsky has had a remarkably diverse and influential career, starting with a PhD in physics um, from Princeton University in 1978, then moving to the Department of Neurobiology at Harvard Medical School, then the Department of Biophysics at John Hopkins, then to Caltech as a visiting professor of neurobiology and Sherman Fairbright visiting scholar. He's now an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and holds the Francis Crick Chair at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. And he's also a professor of biology at the University of California, San Diego, where he co-directs both the Institute for Neural Computation and the NSF Temporal Dynamics of Learning Center. In addition, he's the professor of the Neural Information Processing Systems Conference, NIPS, um, probably the leading machine learning conference in the world, and advises on the Obama Brain Initiative. His work has been absolutely pioneering across both neuroscience and artificial intelligence. Among many other things, he co-invented um, the Boltzmann machine with Jeff Hinton and has developed new algorithms and applications of algorithms that have made really important progress on a range of difficult problems in speech, vision, signal processing, and, and data mining. And he continues to set his sights on some of the biggest and most important problems in science, including understanding the computational resources of the brain and the principles linking brain uh, mechanisms and behavior. Here at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, our focus is on transformative new technologies that are really going to change the world in coming years and decades, and looking at both the global challenges that they may pose, but also the global challenges that these new technologies can help us to solve. And it can be argued that no technology is going to change the world as utterly in coming years and decades as artificial intelligence will. And as such, it's a privilege to hear from one of the real giants in the field about both the breakthroughs that have made deep learning possible and the advances that are going to happen in deep learning and artificial intelligence and the impacts that they're going to have on the world in the years to come. So please put your hands together for Professor Terry Sanofsky. Can you hear me? Good. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I've, this is the fourth lecture I've given here in Cambridge, by far the largest audience. Uh, but thank you all for coming. Um, in preparing this lecture, I thought it might be a good idea to uh, look up a definition for intelligence. After all, we all use it, but we mean different things by it. So I looked it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica, and there were three entries. There's artificial intelligence, there's human intelligence, and there's military intelligence. <laughs> so I'm going to focus on the first two. Now, my working definition of intelligence is basically problem solving. Being able to take a puzzle and uh, understand, get to the bottom of it, and to be able to use it, for example, if, uh, to build a tool, to be able to uh, be able to make a measurement. Uh, th these are what really has created modern civilization. Now, the word artificial intelligence actually goes back to 1956, a famous meeting at Dartmouth. It was actually a summer research project spreading out over the summer. There were 10 pioneers, uh, including Alan Newell and Herbert Simon from Carnegie Mellon. And these were the early days of digital computers, of early 50s. Uh, von Neumann had developed a computer at the Institute of Advanced Study. And Alan Newell uh, and Herbert Simon used it to write a program called The Logic Theorist, which could prove theorems from Bertrand Russell's Mathematica Principia. And, and it, you know, if, if you could do math at that level, who knows what else could possibly be done with, by programming a digital computer. And of course, the, uh, the leaders in the field, uh, including uh, Marvin Minsky at MIT, thought that you know, our, our ability to, uh, if we could do logic and we could play games, learning how to play, uh, for example, backgammon and checkers, 
uh, that should lead directly to enormous advances in, in, in producing a program that could think. The, one of the first grants at the MIT lab, AI lab, that Marvin Minsky founded was a DARPA project funded by the military to build a robot that could play ping pong. They got the grant, millions and millions of dollars. And so they set out to build a robot, and they realized they had forgotten to ask for any money to build a vision system. And the story goes that they assigned it as a summer project to a graduate student. <laughs> Little knowing how difficult the problem was, it would take literally uh, 30 years and a million times in improvement in computer speed and memory to even come close to human abilities. But none, and I, I actually, this, this is an interesting uh, story. I actually talked to Marvin about this. I thought it was an apocryphal story, but it turned out I told it to Marvin. He, he, he said, well, you got it all wrong. We did not assign it to a graduate student. We assigned it to undergraduates. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the proof I actually found in the MIT archives, the Summer Vision Project. And so they actually were, their, their goal was to attempt to use our summer workers effectively in the construction of a significant part of a visual system. But needless to say, they, they uh, didn't make much progress in that. And the reason was that vision is something we take for granted because evolution has worked on it for hundreds of millions of years. And uh, it's not, we're not conscious of all of the heavy lifting that is done by all the subcortical circuits and, and all the different visual areas. And, and therefore, uh, and, and by the way, this is true of the motor system as well. Uh, we're extremely flexible and we can do all these amazing things, play tennis and so forth. Uh, and those are things that are extremely difficult to program. Proving mathematics was a lot easier. So it's, it, it really has something to do with the nature of the problem. Now, I asked uh, Alan Newell, I got to know him pretty well, and I asked him, why is it that in that first group of 10 people, there weren't any neuroscientists? Because after all, the only existence proof you could solve these problems was the fact that nature solved them. And here's what he said. He said that, well, you know, I was, we were open to getting any insights from the brain, but not enough was known about the brain at the time. And indeed, in the 50s was the time when the great breakthroughs were being made. Just uh, Hodgkin, Huxley in 52, uh, Bernard Katz, uh, synapse, action potentials. This is all just beginning and, and really the idea was to, well, if neuroscience can't help us, maybe we'll be able to make progress by implementing programs that will solve the problem in a different way. And you know, let's give them a chance. Uh, but now it's pretty clear that uh, insights from the brain really are proving to be extremely helpful. But I have to be very careful about what I mean by that. Uh, if you approach the brain, you discover it's exceedingly complicated, tremendously, uh, for all the way from the molecular level up to the entire central nervous system is just structure and uh, mechanisms. Uh, there's there's uh, chemical signaling occurring at synapses. There's a terrific amount of connectivity within the brain. What we're tr trying to do here, if we want, to, uh, uh, we want to abstract from that complexity, general principles that we think could be incorporated into a simplified version uh, that was be able to process information using the same principles. And, and for example, let's take one that's often used in AI, a bird, right? The goal isn't to recreate a bird with all its feathers, right? That's, nature's already done that. But you can extract a principle, for example, how do birds glide, right? That has to do with aerodynamics. So if you understand something about aerodynamics, you don't need feathers, you can just put up a wing and then you have to power it. You don't have to have flapping, you can do it with an engine. And so that's what we want to do. We want to create, uh, we want to create something based on the same principles that nature has been using, but with different materials. So the, some of the principles we're going to have is, first of all, there are a lot of these neurons. There are 100 billion in your brain. So there's, it's, they're all working in parallel, massively parallel. They're connected, highly interconnected. Each neuron is connected with about 10,000 other neurons. So we have to have uh, on the order in the, our brains of 10 to the 15 synapses. And that's a, a magnificently large number. It's, 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 it's really a uh, um, huge uh, set of, uh, pr of parameters now that the brain has available because of synaptic plasticity. The strength can be changed through experience. Now, the, the, 
the, the line of research that led to deep learning was very much influenced by the visual system. And one of the first things that was discovered in the visual system by Steve Kuffler, who was my postdoctoral mentor at Harvard Neurobiology, was the fact that uh, in, the, in, the, in the cat, the ganglion cells came in two flavors. Uh, there was one that had an excitatory center that would produce a burst of spikes when the light came on in the center. And then there is another uh, parallel pathway that would produce a burst of spikes when the light went off. And then there's an antagonistic surround that was also important. The principle there is you only want to transmit information when there's a change either in time, light goes on and off, or across space. And so you're looking for contrast between a particular location and its uh, surrounding spatial location. Now, the, uh, and, and finally, this is probably, it turned out to be really crucial for getting the networks to scale up the way they were. These uh, ganglion cells are tiled across the retina. So there's about a million of them in each retina of each eye. And, and they, uh, they're located at different locations and they're running in parallel up to the brain, about a million uh, ganglion cells per optic nerve. Now, uh, I can actually illustrate this for you just to get you a, a sense for what the signals look like. And this is a chip that was designed by Toby Delbrook at the uh, Institute for Neuroinformatics at the University of Zurich, and I was just there. To, uh, and and uh, this is a, a retinal chip, but it's very simple. Uh, but it has, if every pixel has two different uh, outputs that could be either, uh, either you get a spike when it increases or, or another, another uh, line would be a spike when it decreases. So the on and off ganglion cells are represented at every pixel. If there's no change, then there's no, uh, there's no spike and it's gray. White represents a spike when it goes up and black when it goes down. So I'm going to play this movie for you. Now, one thing you notice that is 99% of the time there are no spikes. It's only where there's information. And here's an example where you can see the white and the black because of the fact that it's rotating. Now he's going to put sunglasses in front so you can see it's not the absolute intensity that's driving it. It's the relative intensity. It's the change. And that's really much more important. And that's what the information is transmitted to the brain. Keep in mind, this is really interesting. You see a, you see a scene out there. You see people. You see objects. But really, all you're seeing is a bunch of spikes. That's all, that's all your brain sees. Now, this is a rotating disk that's going around like 200 times per second. And uh, normally, with real camera, it would, just look, it would look like a, a, the annulus. But you can see that if you have very, very small time slices, 40 microseconds, you can actually track that rotating dot at a very, uh, and, and it's because of the fact that the spikes are asynchronous. There is no clock. Now here is going through uh, Zurich, and unfortunately we're not getting the sound, but let me quickly see if I can't Get this started. No, it's on. OK, well, we won't hear the sound. It's too bad, because what, 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 what the sound would tell you is what the sound of a single ganglion cell sounds like. It's like a rat tat 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 whenever something changes. Um, but we'll have to just uh, imagine that. Something humans are very good at. OK. so. Uh, so th there's these principles of tiling, these principles of representing only things that carry information, principles of doing things in parallel. Uh, let's put that together into a very simplified, very, very ultra simple model of a neural network that consists of one neuron. And that turns out to be a perceptron, what's called a perceptron. It was invented by Frank Rosenblatt in 1959. And uh, he was a, a polymath uh, who was an engineer at Cornell. Uh, and he had this idea at the same time that Marvin Minsky and others in AI were going down the programming path. He was the one who was first had the idea that let's build something that looks a little bit like the brain. He called it a perceptron. It had one output. It had a bunch of inputs. It was fiendishly simple, but in fact, because of the fact that computers weren't very good at arithmetic back then, he actually built it out of parts. An analog computer it was sitting there, a big rack of potentiometers for the weights that connected the inputs to the uh, output. 
and, and so let me give you a sense, because actually, if you know the principle of the perceptron, then scaling this up to a deep learning network is actually adding more layers but, and more, more detail. Uh, and, and just to be more concrete, let's say that these inputs represent an image. And each of these is a pixel in the image, right? What we want to do is to be able to recognize what's in the image. We want to classify it. Is this a dog or not? Is this a glass or not? And, and his approach was to do it by learning, by giving it many examples and adjusting the weights with a learning algorithm that then will converge to being able to do the classification of new objects that had the same properties, a dog detector. Okay, and so the way it would work uh, is to adjust the weights on every trial uh, where you had a mistake. If you got it right, you don't make any change, but if, if you, you get it wrong, uh, then you change the weight so that the next time you'll, it's, it'll, you'll get it right or closer to getting it right. So you, the way it works is you sum up all the pixels with all the weights. Uh, if it's above some threshold, then the output is one, category, yes, or zero, not in the category. And here's a concrete example. This actually is a project I worked on back in the 90s. We called it SexNet. And it's, it's a perceptron whose job is to distinguish the sex of a face. So here are the pixels. It's the input to the perceptron. Here are the weights. Each of these little squares represents the size of the weight by how big the square is. And the white ones are positive. The negative ones are black. Now, I I'm going to ask uh, the audience whether this is a, uh, these are college age students. We've cut out everything that uh, might give it away by the hair uh, or secondary sexual characteristics. Is the, how many people here think this is a male? One, two, three. Okay, how many think it's a female? How sure are you? Well, how do you know? Uh, how, what, what, can you tell me in words? Can you program this? Can you tell me, you know, how am I going to figure this out? Yes? Oh, okay. Well, so you're saying there's a feature. There's some feature that you can use. Well, it turns out that if you pick out any single feature, it will fail for some people, even though it might work for others. And that's really the problem. The problem is that uh, there's information from the entire face that contributes to making this decision. And, and you can tell that by the fact that uh, all of the, the pixels are either white or black, and uh, they are varying degrees of, 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 of influence. For example, uh, by the way, white means more likely to be male. This is a male detector. Uh, uh, you can see the area around the nose uh, is, is predisposes toward maleness. Uh, the jowl of the eyes, whereas the area around the mouth and the area around the cheekbones is more toward the female spectrum. And it's, it's, a, it's a weighting, and there's it, it no single part of the image that really carries the, all the information. So this is really a, a whole different approach. It's not programming. It's giving examples, and that really is a very different way to try to solve a difficult problem. Now, there's a fly in the ointment, and that has to do with the fact that the perceptron, although it, there was a learning algorithm that you could prove would converge to a set of weights to solve the problem if such a set of weights existed. But as Minsky and Papert pointed out, they wrote a book that was published in 69. There are many problems for which the perceptron will fail. And in fact, it's only linear predicates, namely ones for which you can pass a plane th through the points that separate the categories that uh, this simple algorithm will, will work. And, uh, and just to illustrate that, actually, this, this book was, is, is really a beautiful mathematical treatise. And it really had to do with the geometric analysis of the class of problems that, that uh, are solvable and others that aren't. And one of the things that they showed was that the perceptron is not capable of distinguish between these two spirals. One of them is two spirals. The other one is one spiral connected. And in the perceptron, no matter how many examples you give, it's not going to solve the problem. OK, so can you tell which one is one and which one is two? Anybody want to venture a guess? The bottom is one. Does everybody, everybody agree with that? Bottom is two. OK, well, let's, let's just do the experiment. OK, come on. 
is 2. So this one is 2. This one, as you'll see, is 1. Now, it's very interesting, isn't it, that the perceptron fails exactly where most of you fail. In other words, this is a hard problem for humans, and you have to, I have to trace it out to be sure, right? Which is doing something sequential. Okay, so th this, <laughs> this book, although it was a wonderful, wonderful mathematical analysis, which actually served as a wonderful foundation for future work, came at the very end with the following statement. There is no reason to suppose that any of these virtues, namely the linearity, the, the, uh, the learning algorithm, the convergence proof, uh, will carry over to the many layered version. Because it was pretty clear you can get around the problem if you had instead of just one layer of connection strengths, if you had two or more, you might be able to overcome these uh, limitations. And that's pretty much put the kibosh on neural networks for 20 years. Until another generation came uh, into the world and um, had uh, that weren't as, uh, as, as intimidated by uh, the, the, the Minsky and Papert. Uh, by the way, if you really analyze the, the, the book, right, what they're really saying is that they can't imagine solving the problem, right? That's not the same thing as saying it's impossible. And, 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 and when an expert basically tells, gives you advice that this, it's not possible, don't take it. And so this is Jeff Hinton. Uh, Jeff and I met in 1979. And uh, he came to visit me here. We met at a workshop. And here, here he's visiting me in front of my apartment in Boston. I was at uh, Harvard uh, Medical School. And we were convinced that there has to be a way, the brain solved it, that we should be able to figure it out, how to, how to overcome this problem, the, the, the logjam. Um, Little did we know how long it was going to take, but we, we had the belief that it was possible. And uh, Jeff actually has a very interesting background. He did his undergraduate work here at Cambridge, and then his PhD at Edinburgh. And he was the great, great grandson of George Bull, who was a very important figure in computer science because he invented Boolean logic upon which digital computers are based. Now, in looking through the book, I actually was shocked to find out that it wasn't just about logic, which is you know, what AI was all about, uh, symbol processing, uh, rules, discrete mathematics. But here, it says the laws of thought, uh, based on the mathematical theories of logic and probabilities. And so half the book is actually about probabilities. And we now know in machine learning that this is really, the, by far, the most important thing. Just like the perceptron had to add up a lot of probabilities and, 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 and find out what the, what the preponderance was, uh, so too you can do that in a much more elegant way using Bayesian analysis and many other approaches that have been developed in machine learning. In fact, machine learning is a big toolbox with dozens and dozens of tools. Deep learning is just one of them. It's gotten a lot of press recently because it solves some big problems, but really you need the whole toolbox if you really want to solve difficult problems. Now, Jeff and I... <laughs> We were very naive in the sense that, you know, again, we didn't appreciate the difficulty of the problem. We thought that there should be some way that, for example, you could develop a, if you want to recognize an object, a bunch of neurons interacting with each other that would do constraint satisfaction, that they would all come to a conclusion that would give you a, the, the, a, a label for the object. And, and the problem is when you have nonlinear networks, it's impossible to analyze them, and the best you can do is simulate them, and that's what we did. But the real breakthrough came when we heard a talk by John Hopfield, who was my, actually my PhD advisor at Princeton. And John Hopfield had developed a network that is now called the Hopfield network. It's a totally recurrent network. It's very highly nonlinear. And he made a simplifying assumption that all the connections are reciprocal, so that if A is connected to B, B is connected to A with the same weight. And it turns out, under that special case, you can prove convergence. And he used, it was called an attractor network because no matter where you start it, it will end up in one of these discrete attractors. And so you can use it for content addressable memory. You can give it a bit of the, of the answer you want. It will complete it. It will find the rest of it. Just as if, you know, I gave you someone's name and you can imagine what their face is by the fact that it's stored somewhere else and it will find 
the, uh, the, the, the it'll complete that uh, vector. Now, what Jeff and I did, this is actually something that uh, is nice of, of these local minima, but we wanted to find the global minima. We wanted to, to get, hop out of these, uh, these the local minima, and, and the way we did it was by heating up the network, and that's what we call the Bolson machine. And the Bolson machine, the job of the Bolson machine is to come to equilibrium, and the way we do that is by letting each of these binary units flip up and down, depending on their total input. So unlike the perceptron, which is deterministic, this is something that is going to be fluctuating just the way, for example, uh, you have a gas or you have a magnet uh, that, have, that can be in two different states. In addition to the input layer and the output layer, we had these hidden units. And these are the ones that we want to be able to do to discover features, features that allow us to discriminate between different classes of inputs. And, and lo and behold, and this is something that came completely out of the blue, in the process, and by the way, it's, it's easy to find the global minimum now. You basically heat it up and you cool it down and it will gradually fall into the global minimum for you. So we thought we had, you know, that was our goal. But it turned out something magical happened when you come to equilibrium. You can prove a learning algorithm that uh, is guaranteed to find weights between the network, which produce something even more important than classification. It, pr it produces an internal generative model of the probability distribution of the mapping. So this is really great. So here's what happens after doing the Boltzmann learning. And I won't go into the details. Uh, after giving it many examples, then when you uh, let go of the inputs and clamp one of the outputs, what will happen is that it will generate inputs from that distribution. It will create new inputs. It's a generative model, which is much more powerful in many respects. Now, the problem with the Bolson machine was that it was very slow. You had to come to equilibrium. You had to collect statistics. It was looking at the correlations between the units that you need to update them. And uh, it wasn't, uh, well, fortunately, a few, uh, it wasn't, uh, didn't take long for David Rummelhart and many other people at the time to discover, to realize that, wow, if Minsky and Papert were wrong, maybe there are other algorithms that could solve the problem. And he found one, which is very popular, called Backprop. And I'll explain that in a second. But what, you, what Dave did was really just do something very simple, which was take the perceptron learning algorithm and recapitulate it on the earlier levels, layers of weights. So you can basically do the same game namely going, reducing the error, and you can do that at every level. And here's an example of a network that I developed at, at, back when I was at Johns Hopkins, which is called NetTalk. And the goal here is to produce uh, a, a really a text-to-speech, namely to be able to a assign a phoneme, an a specific speech sound to every single letter on the input. We had a window of seven letters, and we moved the word through one letter at a time. And the output was the, we were going to train the network to produce the correct phoneme. Uh, so for example, this is the word translate. And the correct phoneme here is the, the sound N. Mm. Uh, and when the network gets the wrong result, M is close, but it's, you know, it's not correct. Uh, what you do is you take that error, uh, correct the weights here with this algorithm that's similar to the perceptron algorithm. And then you take the gradient and back project it. So now you're looking at uh, the contributions that all of these units, uh, and these are the ones that are going to create features on the middle layer. And now you tune up these uh, weights so that you have features that can improve the performance over and over again. And what was amazing was that when we started out, of course, uh, we had a, a small corpus. And let's see if it's going to play. I'm afraid it won't. But I have a recording. Ah, it's, it's not working. Uh, it's it's a, 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 a corpus, and actually, this is the corpus. It's a, a transcription of a, a child from the Barrios in Los Angeles. Uh, and, and what we did was we trained the network to sound just like the child. So it could, it could you know, if, if we could play it, what you would hear is this uh, really quite remarkable uh, rendition of something that the ch child actually said. And we can actually put new text through it because it can generalize. And that really is the key to learning, is not just to memorize, but to actually be able to extract regularities and to be able to then apply them to new words that come and that have similar uh, structure that you can now use to, uh, to as you can see here, read, read this whole page of text. And it's really too bad because it's really 
it's really a, a very fetching uh, demonstration. Okay, so here we are. Uh, we have these new learning algorithms. It's 1980s, and they're tiny by today's standards. They have a few hundred units, they have a few thousand weights. But, you know, they, we could show that they could do better than the perceptron, in fact, uh, surprisingly well in this particular problem. And I was really delighted to be asked to give a talk at the AI lab at MIT uh, by Michael Dertuzis, who was the head of the Department of Computer Science and AI Department at MIT. And so I did, you know, prepare a lecture um, and was, you know, very proud that I was going to be talking to the department. And so I uh, had a nice chat with him in the morning and he said, we have a tradition here where we'd like to have a discussion, a dialogue between the distinguished lecturer and the faculty um, a, 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 as part of our lunch. And I said, fantastic, that's great, I'll get to meet all the faculty. And as we're going up the elevator, he, he turns to me and says, and they hate what you do. And ding, the door opens. <laughs> And, and uh, we'll give you five minutes to sort of I introduce uh, the topic and then we'll have the dialogue. And so I walk in and there's tears. I mean, he's, he, he was surprised that there, there were more people than usually come to lunch. And there's, so there's one tier where the first tier was the senior faculty and behind them were the junior faculty and behind them were the graduate students, right? So it was, it was amazing. It was like a little arena. And so here I am, I'm standing there and what can you possibly say in five minutes that could have any impact on a hostile audience? So I said, well, do you see that fly sitting there? That fly has 100,000 neurons, a lot less than you have in your brain, but it can see, it can fly, it can find food, and it can mate and reproduce itself, which is pretty good with 100,000 neurons, right? Now, you have a supercomputer downstairs that costs you $10 million. It's, you know, a Cray XMP. That computer can't see. It can't fly. <laughs> and the food that it needs is human sacrifice. Constant programs that have to be, has to be fed into the computer, right? And, and in addition to the power bill. And these computers have been networked and they've never reproduced. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? Dead silence. And I looked around, and it's finally one of the senior faculty put their hands, well, we haven't written the vision program yet. Yeah. Well, good luck with that. You've been trying for a while here. Um, and then uh, Jerry Sussman, uh, upholding the honor of computer science, said, well, Turing has proven that if it's computable, we can write a program. So it's inevitable that, you know, this will eventually happen. And I said, okay, well, let, let's, let's give you that, but how long will it take to run your program? <laughs> because if you don't get the answer in uh, 100 milliseconds, you're gonna be eaten. So that was the end of the dialogue with the faculty. <laughs> <laughs> However, an, an undergraduate actually put up their hand and said, well, no, the, the difference between the fly and the supercomputer downstairs is that the fly is a special purpose computer. It, 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 it really, it, it can't balance my checkbook. Whereas a digital computer, I can program it to do anything, but not, not very well, but it does, it does a reasonable job for balancing the checkbook. And he was right, and it is actually that is the right answer. The right answer is uh, uh, nature has evolved incredibly detailed circuitry. The, the algorithm is actually in the circuit. And, and it's if extremely efficient, not just from the information point of view, but from the energy point of view, because the fly doesn't have a lot of energy that it can run on. It right, really is at the limit there of, of, of the, the amount of uh, food that it has available to run its, its body, and its, its flying is very uh, energy intensive. So, um, and, 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 and this is why it's actually instructive to study the fly eye because you might learn something about vision algorithms that actually work in the real world by looking at the connectivity pattern and following the signals as they go through. And that will give you some hints about you know, what, how vision is handled in, in, in brains. Okay, so that was back in the 80s. And now I'm gonna fly you into the future to 
a NIPS meeting. This was held in Lake Tahoe in 2013. And at this meeting, Jeff Hinton and two of his graduate students had a, a paper. OK, so they had made a quantum leap in performance on something called ImageNet. ImageNet is a huge uh, 20 million uh, set of images with 22,000 categories that was put together to challenge computer vision. And, and, and the progress in computer vision was going incrementally every year by half percent reduction in error. And in one year, they had lowered it by 20 percent. That's like 40 years of research. The traditional way of, of, of solving a problem is to take a new class and figure out what the features are that distinguish it from other objects. And, and it takes more than one. It, it, and often, you know, there's ambiguities and there's occlusion. And so it's a very difficult problem. And so it takes like a, a man year or two man years to, to, to be able to do that. And of course, that goes very slowly. Here, what, if you have all of the images, basically you can learn what features distinguish the different objects and separate them. And, and it takes much more computer power, but it takes much less human labor. And that's really the trade-off. That's what's going on here with AI, is that traditional AI is very computer programming, human labor intensive, whereas if you can learn, all you need is lots of data, and, and the real world is filled with all kinds of data. So that's really what was happening here. But the, you, know, you, you still want, might want to ask, why did it take so long? I mean, this after all, you know, 20 years, what was going on? Well, it turned out that over the 20 years, uh, several other learning algorithms were discovered, uh, that uh, structure architectures were uh, added to the feedforward network so that they weren't just all to all. Uh, new uh, ways of putting uh, short-term memory into recurrent networks were developed. And finally, uh, a very simple primitive form of learning that's in all species, just about all species, reinforcement learning or classical conditioning, turned out to be extremely powerful in ways that we really no one appreciated. Now, in terms of the feedforward networks, the most successful network in, for deep learning has been something called a convolutional network or convnet. And, and the convolution there is, is just the tiling I was telling you about, the idea that you have these uh, units that are looking at a little piece of the visual field, just like the ganglion cells. And, and uh, Steve Kuffler, who discovered the, these circular symmetric receptive fields, gave it as a job to his two postdocs, David Hubel and Torsten Weasel, to record from neurons in the visual cortex and see what's up there. And what they reported was uh, cells that responded with linear features instead of circles, lines. And this is an excitatory region, an on region, and this is an off region. And this is, gives you a sense of the scale. That's about 20 microns across. This is a tungsten microelectrode. David Hubel invented it and allowed him to, them to record, really, single neurons, which before was extremely difficult. So this is a new principle. This is a, a linear filter that's oriented. And, and there are many, every, at every location in the visual field, there are uh, cells that have all possible orientations. Uh, that, 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 again, tile the, the, the retina with these features. The second type of cell they found was called a complex cell. And it was like the simple cell in being oriented. It gave you a, a lot of spikes when you had the right orientation and none when it was wrong. But it would give it, it didn't have an on and off regions. It would provide a lot of spikes no matter where it was within this little rectangle there. That's the part of the visual field called the receptive field, which when you're in it with the right stimulus, you get a bunch of spikes. And then finally, another feature, uh, another important part of the visual system had been worked out. Uh, and this is a summary by uh, Van Essen. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that there's a whole hierarchy of visual areas. There's like two dozen areas. Each one of these boxes is a bunch of neurons that have a map of the visual field in it, like the retina, uh, V1, V2, V3, V4. And, and there's a hierarchy in which the cells have bigger and bigger receptive fields but become more and more specialized in terms of their response properties. Until you finally get to the very top in the infratemporal cortex where now we know if you take it out, you have trouble recognizing objects. So it's probably the case that at the very top, you have cells that really represent unique objects. Now this was all put together over uh, 20 years by Jan LeCun, uh, working with Jeffrey in a group uh, that was funded by the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. Now, isn't this interesting? There were, uh, Jeff at the time was in Toronto, and the Canadian government thought this was an important enough project that they funded them for 10 years, a group of 20 people, 
not a lot of money. It was mainly for having meetings, uh, you know, money to, to, to uh, uh, offset teaching duties. But this is really, you know, the, 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 something that took that long in order to be able to make incremental progress. And of course, during that time, computers got faster and faster. And finally, when GPUs came up, that was a factor of 100 that occurred almost instantaneously because of the fact that they had architectures that actually resembled in some way massively parallel to the way that the brain is organized. So here's, here is the, the, the final architecture that's now in use today. Uh, it, it has these layers, but each of the layers is connected by a, a very interesting sequence of operations. First, there's these linear filters, which are the weights, followed by a threshold nonlinearity, like the perceptron, except that it's uh, gentler. And then finally, uh, th uh, there's a pooling, where you pool across space the same feature, and this is exactly what the complex cell does in, in that Hubel Weasel discovered, right? It, it, it variants across space. And then finally, and this is starting to be really important, you, what you do is you normalize so that the operating range of the output neuron is between its limits. And this is done in the cortex by feedback inhibition. And of course, you know, here by a, just a simple over normalization tool. But the, the, the idea, though, is that this motif is repeated over and over and over again. And, and it really resembles, in many respects, uh, the, the hierarchy of the areas that I showed you, V1, V2, V4. And in fact, in experiments done on monkeys by Jim DiCarlo, uh, if you train up monkeys on the same set of inputs that are given to one of these uh, convolutional networks, you discover that the statistics of the response properties at each one of these levels are very similar. For example, in V1, uh, you have these simple cells that look like these edge detectors, and you also get these uh, exactly the same types of, of linear filters here in the first layer of, of the convolutional network. And that turns out to be because these uh, simple cells that are oriented turn out to be a natural basis set for natural images. And that was discovered earlier. But it's true now for even these very complex networks. Now, finally, the recurrent networks are very important because of the, in the cortex, there's a lot of connectivity within the cortex. Uh, with these recurrent connections produce circulating activity. And it's possible to actually put that into the network and learn the degree to which you want the information to circulate. And you put that all together, and, and magic happens. So I'm just going to show you an example of what you get out from the scene. You take this complex scene. You pass it through a deep convolutional neural network. And you pick out all the objects. And then you feed them to a recurrent neural network that has been trained to caption the image. So it's been it's trained on a lot of images with captions. And now you give it a new one. This has never seen this before. What, it, what it pops out? A sequence of words. A group of people shopping at an outdoor market. Well, that's not a bad idea. I mean, it, it looks like an outdoor market, and there are a bunch of people uh, not clear what they're doing. There are many vegetables at the fruit stand. That's kind of a confusing statement, but it might actually be true. <laughs> but here's, here's some more examples, and it's really remarkable. Now, in addition to uh, coming up with a bunch of words, it will tell you which part of the image each word is, is uh, pointing toward. So a woman is throwing a Frisbee in the park. So there's the Frisbee. Not clear if she's throwing or catching it, but you know that's not a bad interpretation. A dog is standing on a hardwood floor. Well, there's a dog. There's a hardwood floor. I'm not sure whether it's standing or not, but it's there. A little girl sitting on the bed with a teddy bear. Well, there's a girl. There's a teddy bear. I'm not sure it's a bed, but maybe it was a pull-out bed. <laughs> and finally, a group of people sitting on a boat in the water. It nailed it. Okay. What's amazing is that this is natural language. And this is something we'd have never guessed I mean, you know, 20 years ago. And the reason was we had no idea whether these networks would scale or not. The experience in AI has been that almost all of the algorithms that were developed early on scaled miserably. Combinatoric explosion, you start coming up with rules and layers of rules and rules that interact with each other. And they're very labor intensive. And they just become extremely difficult to work with. And, and, and just to, to show you how uh, good things have uh, uh, the, the power uh, of some of these networks, recurrent networks in particular, in November, Google released a new version of Google Translate, which almost overnight went from kind of a hacky phrase-based approach, where you look at groups of words and try to translate them to sentence-based using deep neural networks with recurrent connections so that you can have sequences. You can learn sequences. In this case, 
uh, they learned to translate between languages. So in came the French and out came the English. And it was so good that it was really difficult even to separate out. You know, I mean, how, how, how was it able to figure the translation? Of course, it had many, many examples from the Canadian Parliament where they had the simultaneous English and French versions by law. Uh, and so someday, this doesn't exist yet, but very soon you'll have an app on your cell phone that allows you to go to a foreign country like Russia and uh, be able to instantly translate you know, what was on the wall there, especially if you're going to Japan. Okay, so the final algorithm I want to tell you about is I think the most exciting and the most interesting from the point of view of sociology. And that has to do with a uh, temporal difference learning algorithm that was developed by Rich Sutton in 1988. He was, uh, he, 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 literally, he, he, he wanted to understand what's going on when you uh, learn to associate a, a sensory input with a motor output. Uh, the way that Pavlov's dog, for example, would associate a bell with food, it would salivate, right? And, and, and it turned out that uh, th this algorithm, which is called temporal differences, is actually implemented. We now know experiments have been done showing that the dopamine cells in mammalian brains, which uh, distribute uh, signals very widely throughout the cortex, especially the prefrontal cortex and also the basal ganglia, which is the, the center here, uh, which is a set of nuclei that are very important for motivation. But it's now known that the signals they carry are called a reward prediction error. So it compares the reward you get with what you predict. There's a value function that you learn, and it predicts that sensory input you give me this much positive feedback. And you, you subtract, and the difference is used to learn a better value function. And also to be able to control your motor system so that you can be rewarded more often in the future. Every addictive drug increases the level of dopamine activity artificially because obviously you're not doing anything except taking the drug, but that means that you're addicted to taking the drug, and so this is a real problem. Uh, and actually, this, this, uh, this, this model is actually one that uh, Peter Diane and Reed Montague and I published uh, in 1994, and like I say, it's been established now in Monkeys by Wilhelm Schultz. And in fact, Peter and Wolfram won the Brain Prize just this year for their work. So it's really a spectacular piece of neuroscience. But the, the question was, you know, if you put it into a network, um, what can you do? What can that do? It seems like a very weak learner. You're only getting input when there's reward or not. Uh, but already in 1995, Jerry Tassaro, who was a former postdoc of mine, uh, did a project in which we, we trained up a network uh, to play backgammon. I'm not going to explain backgammon if you don't know. It's a popular game. A lot of people play it for high stakes. It's positional. It's, you, you roll the dice, so there's some uh, probabilities involved. And it's much more difficult to predict the future because it's not deterministic. But it makes a perfect model for neural networks because that's what neural networks are good at. They're good at pattern recognition. But uh, the, the, the goal here was to uh, get your men off before the other person. You only get reward at the very end when you actually win. And at the beginning, uh, Jerry had this great idea of letting the program play itself. And so he could play millions of, 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 of games against each other, and it kept getting better and better. Uh, at this point, he was at IBM, uh, TJ Watson. Uh, he, he, it was beating him, so he got people from New York to come. And uh, it, it, it was credible. It was uh, Barbara Birdie, who actually has written books about backgammon, said that, you know, this is the best backgammon program I've ever played. It's really good. Well. You know, you let it play for another uh, million, and Roberti comes back, and it plays him to a standstill. And he said, this is not just the best program I've ever seen. It could easily win the championship, the world championship, uh, uh, you know, if he had the right roles. And uh, that was amazing, because this program, the learning, had actually discovered new positions, game positions, that no human had ever come up with, which were better, which were demonstrably better. So it was being creative as well as getting better and better. It was, it was getting creative in the same way that humans get better, by learning. Now, this uh, found its culmination, as you well know, in March, when DeepMind, using reinforcement learning coupled with deep learning, was able to overcome uh, a, 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 a using, uh, this is now the game of Go, where there's a much more complex uh, 
set of positions, 21 by 21, the number of possible positions is more than the atoms in the universe. So the fact that you can play, even though there's millions of games that you're playing in the computer, it's still an infinitesimal fraction of everything out there. So you have to learn strategy and you have to learn to generalize. But what was remarkable was that uh, Lee Sidol, who is the South Korean champion, lost the first three games. Completely unexpected. This is a shockwave throughout the Go universe. And, and this was like, you know, inconceivable. Because the Go programs up to this point were so bad, they were weak amateurs. They were really very, very, uh, you know, uh, inconsequential for the people at this level. And so here's, uh, after the third game, uh, here's E.C. Dahl having a press conference. I should have shown a better result, a better outcome, and better content in terms of the game played. And I do apologize for not being able to satisfy a lot of people's expectations. I kind of felt powerless. Fortunately, he won the fourth game. And he, you know, he, 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 he upheld our honor as humans, right? <laughs> But he eventually lost four out of five. But this, was, this is really quite remarkable. Now, at the time that he was playing, he was not the world champion. There was a Chinese, uh, young Chinese uh, Go player by the name of Ki Ji, who uh, said, well, you know, he had already beaten uh, Isi Dal eight out of 10 times. So he said, well, you know, you can beat Isi Dal, but you can't beat me. And in January, there, uh, there was uh, the Go servers had a new player that no one had ever seen before called Master 8. Uh, unbeknownst to the Go players, this was actually uh, AlphaGo 2.0. And it was beating everybody, including Kiji, three times. And here's what he said. This is now uh, just a few months later, January 5th. After humanity spent thousands of years improving our tactics, computers tell us that humans are completely wrong. <laughs> Which, which is really uh, astonishing in the sense that uh, what happened in between the two, by the way, uh, you, know, you, you had time for the computer to play another couple hundred million games. <laughs> so it was getting better and better. In fact, they didn't know how good it was because there's nobody on the planet that they, they, you know, that they could use to calibrate it at this point. Now, the final example I want to give is uh, of a classic problem. And it's, because it's so common, everybody knows about it. And I can use this as an example of impact. So back in 2005, DARPA created a, a competition to, be, to drive a car across the desert in the, in the uh, California, Nevada border area. And it was won by uh, Sebastian Thrun at Stanford using a car that instead of programming it, he basically drove it across the desert through many different uh, locations. He didn't know where it would be, you know, the competition would be. They only tell you five minutes before you have to start. But it, 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 it basically learned how he would react to different visual cues. Like, you know, if it's a rock, you steer around it. If it's a tumbleweed, you don't. And you don't go near the edge of a cliff, you know, things like that, that uh, it learned from experience. And it won the competition. He won $2 million. And, and that really signaled the fact that this is a new, potentially very important technology. And it was, it was something that was uh, really depended very much on learning from example, in this case, from human drivers who are already experts. OK, so uh, I've given you enough examples now that I, I think you should know that uh, there's a very uh, influential essay that was published in the New York Review of Books by Noam Chomsky. This was a hatchet job, the case against B.F. Skinner. And basically, it, it was a brilliant essay, a rhetorical tour de force basically tearing this guy into little shreds about how could you possibly think that something as primitive as classical conditioning, behaviorism, could do anything nearly approaching the magnificence of language or any cognitive capacity. And here's what he said. This is a very small little quote. While the situation is perhaps clearer in the case of language, and, and he's saying here that, you know, unless it's a, a simple abstract model like mine, you have no hope. Uh, there is no reason to suppose that other aspects of human behavior will fall within the grasp of the science, dripping of disdain, constrained by a prior Skinnerian restrictions. And uh, we, really what I think is going on here is, is that he's really, if you analyze the argument, it's an argument from ignorance. I can't imagine that some, such a primitive algorithm could do anything that at all complex 
And I just gave you now two or three examples where language, language translation, language captioning, and many other examples that we have now are producing remarkable advances. Now, you know, this is still very early days, but it's now clear that there are cognitive capacities that will be developed. And maybe it couldn't have been imagined back in 1971, but the fact is that when an expert tells you something is impossible, don't believe them. Uh, finally, now this is, let's just take this, uh, this uh, into the future now. Let's imagine that in fact, self-driving cars, they're possible in principle, it may take 10 years, 20 years. The real problems are going to be regulatory restrictions, uh, local city restrictions, and, 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 and you know, Google has been driving their self-driving cars around uh, the, the San Francisco Bay Area for two million miles, right? And you know, they're, they're, it's actually safer than being in a regular car. But if it's a case that you could press a button and a self-driving car shows up, you don't need to own your own. The average car is only used 5% of the time. Well, what is it doing the rest of the time, 95% of the time? It's sitting in a parking lot. Just think, half, you know, the city is covered with parking lots. Well, if you don't need parking lots, you know, the, the self-driving cars don't have to be parked. They can go out somewhere, if, you know, if they're not being used. That means you can repurpose all the parking lots. You can terraform the city. It's going to transform it. You can turn the, the area around uh, shopping centers into parks. You know, you could, you could create, uh, you know, the, the parking structures can be used in, uh, for museums and who knows what will happen. You know, it's, it's, it's really, it will change the character of cities. But that's not all. These are really safe and they can talk to each other. So there can be many, many fewer collisions. Auto body shops are going to go out of business. The car insurance business is going to collapse. This, they're not going to go easily. They're going to go kicking and screaming because this is a huge uh, economic uh, business in the world. But there's some really good things. There, uh, there's going to be fewer deaths from falling asleep, which happens with truckers very common. Well, uh, there aren't going to be any more drunk drivers because there's going to be drivers. In fact, the only people in the car that can be drunk are the passengers. And finally, this is really astonishing, that the average commute is uh, one way in the U.S. is 26 minutes. And if you add up all the people who commute back and forth each day, it adds up to 3.4 million years of human life. And, and in, uh, not, not in the most pleasant environment in terms of stress and frustration. And just think, you could free all of that up. All that time could be used for something else. And, and, and finally, this is one that I read in the Financial Times actually coming over here. Who would be stupid enough to steal a car that could drive itself back home? <laughs> it's going to put Grand Theft Auto out of business. Okay, so now, uh, some, at the very same time that this is happening, I think there's a certain threshold that was reached in terms of computational power about three years ago, and the algorithms have improved, much more data. But when you reach that threshold, it was interesting that so many problems that were so difficult, speech recognition is a solved problem. Many of these problems all pretty much yielded at the same time. That meant that there was a threshold. You needed a certain minimum in order to get off the ground. And now we're there. This is really remarkable. And we don't know how far it's going to go, but you know this is early days and we'll see. Uh, now, at the same time, as I said, all of the, that convolutional network was based on what we knew in neuroscience back in the 1960s. Well, we know a lot more now. In fact, we're going to know over the next 10 years an enormous amount because just as Kennedy announced that the United States was going to go to the moon back in 1961, and this, these grand challenges are only announced every uh, decade or two, President Obama announced in April 2013 that he was going to have a similar initiative for developing innovative neurotechnologies. And, and that really the goal there was to bring engineers to work very closely with the neuroscientists. The engineers can build things, but they don't know what to build. Neuroscientists have the problems that need to be solved, but they can't build things to solve them. So let's get them together. And, that, and that's what's exactly what's happening and it's taking off in ways that are really remarkable. And I want to show you an example of that. So this is a zebrafish brain. 
And what you're seeing from the top and the side and the front are neurons that are highly active because this zebrafish has a genetically encoded calcium indicator that flashes whenever the neuron uh, is active. When the neuron is firing action potentials, uh, that neuron is, is, is part activating neurons around it that it has connections to. Now, the amazing thing is that uh, this is uh, done at Genelia, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, uh, and what's amazing is that they were able to record from almost all the neurons in the zebrafish brain, about 80,000 neurons at the same, at, at rough, you know, across the whole brain. And so let's play, uh, let's play this. And so you'll see patterns of activity. Now, this zebrafish, it's in a dark room. There's no sensory input. It's immobilized in a gel. And so it's no motor output but the brain is extremely active. So as you can see, there's flashing, flashing, flashing. That means that there's intrinsic activity. It's called spontaneous activity. It's been known for over 80 years. Uh, but what, look how the, the, it's clearly highly correlated. And it's very interesting in terms of the patterns. You could look at this, I could look at this for hours. And, and occasionally you get something, a global event that or coordinated neurons throughout the entire brain. What are we looking at? This is really one of those embarrassing moments when, you know, the Chinese curse, may you get what you wish for. How do you interpret this? Because you can't correlate it with any motor or sensory input or output. What we're seeing, I think, is the zebrafish thinking, how do I get out of this? <laughs> but how are we going to prove it? How are we going to study it? Well, it's already happening. We have a similar signal we can get in humans in fMRI, in brain imaging, and it turns out that the human brain is even more spontaneously active, and it's really interesting to see uh, what that corresponds to. Now, the, uh, the brain initiative uh, was announced in the White House, and this was taken about 10 minutes before uh, the president made the announcement, and the people standing here all made important contributions either to developing the uh, initiative or uh, implementing it. For example, Byung Chun, uh, who is the scientific officer in the Kavli Foundation, was the one who brought the white paper to the White House that, that led to, uh, there, were like, there was a dozen different uh, potential uh, projects that he could have picked. He, NASA wanted to put an uh, asteroid around the moon. Don't ask me why. Uh, the Department of Energy wanted to build a better battery. Now, that's very useful. It's not very sexy, but, you know, they, that's very important. And the president picked the Brain Initiative. And I think one of the reasons was that the Brain Initiative has bilateral congressional support. And it's one of the few things where Obama really, I think, could have picked something that nobody would complain about. And in fact, in last uh, fall, before the election, the Congress passed, with like 90% of the members, a, uh, a bill called Cures Act 21st Century which included $5 billion for health research, including $1.7 billion for the Brain Initiative. So this is very, very good news. And, and the Congress has the purse string, so we know that the Congress is, in, is, is very favorable to this. So it, I'm convinced that this is going to continue throughout the, the next uh, f four years. Uh, Francis Collins, the director of NIH, was responsible for uh, the, the leading this charge. And he put together a committee and included me uh, and 14 others. Uh, and including Bill Newsom, who was the chair, along with Corey Bartman, and uh, the NSF uh, Cora Merritt, and finally uh, the, 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 the mystery woman here. And I was talking to her just before this picture was taken, and I had no idea who she was. And so I introduced myself, and she said, oh, I'm R.G. Prabhakar. I'm the director of DARPA. And I realized this is a great place to network. <laughs> and then somebody tapped me on the shoulder. And so I turned around. And there is Obama. And he's much taller in person than you would think from photos. And he, he, he surprised me. So I wasn't prepared to say anything. So I, the only thing I blurted out was, thank you, Mr. President. And thank you. Uh, and thank you, Terry. Um, we now have um, 20 minutes or so for Q and A, and there are going to be there are going to be a couple of uh, an apologies for these uh, mystery 
uh, audio glitches. Um, we've got no idea where that's coming from. Not, I think, from the microphones themselves. Uh, there are going to be microphones coming around the room, and I'm going to point out people, please wait until a microphone gets to you. Uh, let's start with the person down here at the front on my right. She's not looking at you. Can you discuss some of the challenges in taking the principles that you learned from understanding the brain and actually translating those to other technologies we have? So, for example, uh, you showed that the way the human visual system works, it only records changes in what it sees. Yet, to my knowledge, digital cameras still take you know, information at every pixel, and it's not based on the changes. So can you just discuss some of those challenges? Right. Okay. So, you know, humans are tied to their photos, right? And in and, and, and computer vision, uh, you, you use uh, your own visual system to as assay how well the computer did in, for example, segmenting the object from the background. Um, is that really the best measure? Probably not. And the reason is that it's uh, based on a myth. And the myth is that in your brain, there's a little man watching a monitor, right? It's called the homunculus theory. <laughs> And it's, it's, it's completely false. We've known about, you know, for uh, d decades and decades that it's not a little man. Uh, it's just spikes. And it's immediately coded in terms of spike trains at the retina, and it spikes all the way up. Now, the, 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 the point about spikes is that it's encoding just the information that's relevant for the algorithms upstream. It doesn't have to send up the entire frame. It just sends up the critical parts that, and as you can see, you could recognize Toby actually, just from the fact that when he moves, you can see the outline of his face, and I recognize him. And, 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 and that greatly does a couple of things. First of all, it, um, it reduces the amount of energy that you have and the amount of memory storage that you need, and it is much more efficient in terms of creating the next level of representation, because you can look at the converging spikes from ganglion cells like in the case of the simple cell, it's converging spikes from ganglion cells that are arranged in a line in a linear fashion. So by the very geometry, you can create the feature. So there, there, there are a lot of other uh, very uh, important uh, principles that I didn't tell you about that are equally important. But, but there's a, another problem here, which is the sociology. Uh, and this has to do with the fact that humans, again, they're wedded to this idea of the homunculus. He took his DVS camera to a computer vision meeting. And he set it up, and you can do this in real time, sitting there, you can wave your hand. And so people would come up, what is this? What is it? They would look at it, and, and they, they would say, you know, where's the image? And, and Toby said, no, 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 these are the spikes, and this, this, this is what is coming out of our eye. What does this have to do with computer vision, they would say. In other words, they define computer vision as a, a, you know, using their own visual system to try to outline things and to recognize things. And what we now know is that, you know, everything that our visual system is doing, all those spikes going up, we're not consciously aware of them. And, and, and the computer vision people were basically only trying to model the, the, the very thin thing at the very end, which is what you're consciously aware of, without doing any of the hard work leading up to it, which is what our visual system is doing. Thank you. Next question over here. Uh, thank you. Very nice talk. Unfortunately, I'm old enough to remember almost everything you've recounted uh, firsthand. I was uh, at that age at the time. Um, you, you talked about AlphaGo. Um, AlphaGo, uh, Go DeepMind tried to train AlphaGo using reinforcement learning from scratch and failed. They could only get it to work by copying, I think, several million human games and then using reinforcement learning to tune the algorithm, and then, then it got better than humans. Um, but I guess my question is, do you think uh, that we can find out how to train or how to get machines to learn something as complex as AlphaGo without having human solution to copy in the first place? Well, uh, first of all, I, I didn't have enough time to go into any of the details. And, and you're absolutely right. There are other parts of AlphaGo I, I said nothing about in terms of several deep learning networks and the 
priming part of getting it off the ground. Uh, but let, let me just say this, that um, we have a lot to learn by looking at babies when they come into the world. So, you know, babies just don't get up and start talking, right? They, what they do is they're constantly, they're just absorbing information about things that, are, uh, that they hear and they feel and their mother, and, and they can smile, they can do some motor responses and they have reflexes, but they're, they're in a state where they're using something, another type of learning called unsupervised learning, where you're just taking in the structure of the world and you're trying to create an internal model of it. And we know that's going on for your entire life, but babies are just amazing in terms of how fast they do it. And so this, the equivalent of priming alpha is something that in babies during the first couple of years of their lives. And, and that's what hasn't yet been incorporated into a lot of these algorithms. But that, that is, a lot of work is being done right now in a lot of labs here in Cambridge, Zubin Garamendi's lab, uh, that are really f pushing that forward in terms of being able to create a better starting position for the, a network that is then going to be able to learn from examples. Um, now, the, the, I, we're taking questions uh, all from down the front here. If there are people at the back who would like to ask questions, Please keep your hand up during the previous question so I can get the microphone to you. But the next one is down in the front here. Thanks, Terry, for a fascinating lecture. <clears throat> I was just wondering, um, while I'm also very optimistic about the, the promises, I was wondering whether you have any worries about or concerns about certain risks. I mean, you mentioned, for instance, self-driving cars. Um, there are a lot of you know, computer security issues or, or, or things like that, which is why I think the, probably the car industry, the, the insurance industry, will not go out of business, as long, at least as long as we still have some accidents. But if you have any worries about the types of misuses or applications, what, which ones would that be? Well, uh, so here's the, I think the, the, the without being specific, uh, let's just say that uh, almost every profession is going to be affected. For example, there are now deep learning networks that can diagnose diseases with, with as much, with, with, that are more accurate and objective than the best humans, right? So, so how, but you know, the, the question is, how, how do we incorporate that into our current uh, organization, say in the medical profession or in the, the legal profession or in forensics, or in that case, you know, automobiles? And eventually, uh, adapt. And the problem is that in the past, you know, during the Industrial Revolution, it was possible over many generations to adapt, but it's, we're, we're going to have to do this over our lifetime. You, 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 if you have a job, it may not be doing the same job 10 or 20 years from now, because there'll be new jobs. And, 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 and this is a, a problem, a social problem, it's not a technical problem. And the, 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 the machine learning people are the least prepared to actually have solve them. And we, we need a lot of help from a lot of other sectors of society, uh, experts, and educational system has to change too. So there's a lot of things that, that will have to be coordinated over the next few decades. But ultimately, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I'm optimistic that we can solve those problems. This, this, I think Joman has his, his sheet up. I think he yes, has. But I'm, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering where the microphone has gone. Okay, okay. So, so with the question is, we'll just have to speak as loudly as they can. Uh, we think the problem is associated with the, the radio mics that we've been using. You, sir, in the red top. And you mentioned the various computational levels in real frames, uh, and one remembers that protein molecules can act like transistors, allosteric enzymes, all the way up to the insides of a single synapse up to the neuro level, what would be the current view about the, uh, as it were, tip of this computational iceberg and how important it's going to be for the problems you told us about? Uh, that's actually what I work on in my lab, so I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, what's remarkable about the synapse is that it's so ultra miniaturized that the proteins in the membrane that are responsible for the strength 
number in the, the few dozen to 100. So just think about that, right? We, we've re reduced the ultimate memory that, that you have to just a handful of molecules that are regulated. A lot of the machinery that are uh, found in, inside the synapse, um, and there are hundreds of unique molecules that are just found in, the, say, the, the density under the, the synapse uh, in, on the postsynaptic membrane. Uh, the, the, is, the biochemistry that goes on there is absolutely stunning. And it, it, time scales that range from milliseconds up to minutes to hours to days and beyond. And that, that illustrates is that the most important thing that the brain has to do is to maintain those strengths of those synapses uh, and integrate information coming in over your entire lifetime so that you can still remember what happened to you 20, 30, 40 years ago and still store more information without uh, uh, wiping it out. That's, that's a mystery. And, and it's something that uh, the neuroscientists uh, are actually coming pretty close because we've worked out a lot of the pathways. So I think that we'll, we'll, we'll have some of the answers. And one of the things that my lab did last year actually was to publish a, a, a paper in eLife uh, that made an estimate for how many bits of information you can store at a synapse. And the traditional view amongst neuroscientists is that, well, maybe one or two because you know some are really big, most of them are really small. So the idea was that those are important, but there's a few big ones. And what we showed is that for all the strengths that you can store five bits, whether it's a big synapse or a small synapse, so that immediately overnight, the amount of information you can store in your brain went up by a factor of 10, at least on paper. Um, person in the, uh, yes, you with the white shirt, yeah. Thanks for your interesting talk. Uh, so I was wondering whether you would compare the current state in AI research to something like the mid to late 30s in terms of nuclear research and how maybe to, to eventually create something really powerful, like a general problem-solving AI, like a general artificial intelligence. Uh, you'd need something akin to a Manhattan Project kind of uh, scale, like industrial scale kind of endeavor. Well, okay, so I, I think that I'll repeat what I think the question was, which is uh, how do we go from here to, say, general intelligence, uh, problem-solving AI, and so forth. So I, I actually think that um, we've been misled by our intuition and introspection. In other words, we don't really know how our brain works, but we think we understand, th we have words for things like attention, intention, and, and what, what the history of AI is to try to make programs that uh, to do the, the, that, that implement the, that the last layer of their, which are basically very crude stories that we tell ourselves to try to understand our behavior. You're not aware of, of the, most of the decisions that you make until you've made them. Uh, some part of your brain has made them and you, you then uh, make up a story. Oh, I did that because I was hungry or something. No, uh, you know, if, if there's probably something else behind it, uh, but there's no reason why uh, you need to know. And, and so I think we have to start from scratch. I really think that we don't really understand what real, what general intelligence is. And I, I think that that will be revealed in time as we are able to record from larger and larger parts of the brain and, and under more general conditions. And we'll be able to see how those decisions are really made. And we'll you know, be, do maybe zebrafish and mice and monkeys and so forth first. But even using uh, non-invasive techniques like fMRI, we can already begin to do experiments uh, and, and, and get at uh, issues, for example, in social decision making and uh, the whole area called neuroeconomics, which now is flourishing, has in, having to do with how humans make economic decisions. It turns out that we're not just the ideal uh, you know, economic uh, engine that is just optimizing how much, uh, you know, uh, how much uh, uh, you're, you're uh, taking in in terms of your, uh, your, 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 what's important. We make decisions that are colored by our uh, expectations, uh, by social exchange, and, and a lot of it looks irrational. It, it doesn't make any sense. In fact, Herb Simon, I showed a picture of him, he, made, he received the Nobel Prize from pointing this out. But that's really, uh, it turns out that if, you really, uh, if, you really, if we really understood intelligence, we should be able to understand why, in fact, those decisions are being made the way they are. It's not necessarily a homo economicus. It's, it's really a brain that has a, a making ex 
decisions on the basis of lots of experience and lots of expectations having to do with the future. And, and for example, here's something I, I like to tell my students about, you know, that why are you in class today, right? Would you rather be outside playing football or whatever? And, and, and they, they say, well, yes, but you know, um, if, I, if I'm not in class, I'm not going to get a good grade. If I don't get a grade, I'm not going to graduate. If I don't graduate, I'm not going to go job and so forth. The human species is the only one that has delayed gratification that goes all the way through, you know, their whole you know, early adulthood before they actually get out there in the real world. This is amazing. No other animal is willing to do that. In fact, I remember when I was a young boy and my mother tried to get me to do things and she would say, Terry, you'll get re your reward in heaven. <laughs> it's amazing that humans can tell the stories that, that, that uh, will delay their gratifications until the point where they're no longer here. Um, yeah. uh, thank you for your fascinating lecture. I'm Barbara Sahaki and I'm a professor of clinical neuropsychology here and I'm interested in brain health and, and also uh, mental well-being. Now, most of what you talked about was what we call cold cognition, so it's unemotional cognition. And what I'm really wondering is, uh, do you think you'll be able to actually develop hot cognition or emotional and social cognition, which is partially what we use for risky decision making Okay, the, the, so the, the question was uh, whether robots need emotions, and, uh, and to, this, since this is so important for human exchange, maybe uh, how, how would we incorporate it into our relatively uh, unemotional networks that basically give you the right answer every time, right? Uh, so first of all, the tradition going back, in, in, in cognitive science there was a turning point 1970s, when that uh, article came out, that they adopted this symbol processing approach, and and that took that all the way through. Uh, AI was the theory for cognitive psychology, uh, but uh, just about 10 or 20 years ago, and, and about the same time that we were, uh, Dave Rumlaut and others were really beginning to think about, you know, what was really going on in the brain, uh, we realized that it's really. Uh, Time scale. The thing about emotions is that they have much longer time scales than these fast uh, instant recognition, 100 millisecond, that we have been focusing on. And so if you're organizing behavior over longer time scales, then you need to be able to have ways of modifying the, the, the state of the brain, whether for readiness or whether you know, you're fearful or whether you're in a happy situation. And, and each of these has, means uh, it will mod it'll, the very same stimulus will have very different impact depending on which of these different emotional states that you're in, right? And, and, and in, a, in a productive way, in a sense that it'll be the right thing to do. If you're if you're in a jungle and things are a little bit scary, it's a good thing to be, to jump if you hear something, right? So this is clearly you'd want to be able to uh, uh, modify your behavior. And uh, what's happening now is is, is I think uh, very interesting, which is that. We're beginning to uh, look at those longer time scales, and is, especially if you want to interact with, uh, a, and a robot wants to interact with you, it's going to have to have that same set of time scales, long time scales that you have. And, and I have a <clears throat> longstanding collaboration with Paul Ekman, who is the world's leading expert on facial expressions. And he has a, a technique called FAX, facial action coding, where he is able to look at the, each muscle, 44 muscles in your face, and from that detect you know, uh, what your emotion is. We automated that. We developed a deep learning network that was as, as good as the experts, Paul's uh, trained experts, started a company called Emotions. And uh, it turns out it has tremendous amount of applications in marketing and medicine, many other areas. The company was bought by Apple about a year ago. And it may be uh, within the next year or two, your Apple iPhone, when you open it up, it will look at you and say, why are you upset? And it will be able to detect your emotional state and will have internal circuitry that will be able to, uh, be able to respond appropriately. So, so the answer is, that, yes, that, that's absolutely essential. 
and 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 by the way, it's it's a computation. It's not just a a way to uh, communicate. It's it's we really think now that emotional states have computational significance that are very important on a global scale, not not just the local circuit. Now we're talking about the neuromodulatory systems, like the dopamine system is a really good example of that. There's about a dozen of those in the brain, and they modulate the emotional state of the brain. We're very nearly out of time here. I think I'm going to take just one more question. The person in, in the green. Yes. I want to ask a fun question. Um, as a lay person, and I'm speaking to the only person in the engine room of the game, um, to what extent do you think that Hollywood represents a future that we may, may encounter at some point? You're asking about the future. I'm asking about the way Hollywood is depicting artificial intelligence and how that is, how realistic you think that is. She's interested in the, in the, the, the Hollywood perception, uh, presentation of artificial intelligence. And oh. how, how realistic you think it is? Uh, okay, well, uh, you're talking to the wrong person. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's, here's my take on predicting the future. Uh, I agree with Yogi Berra, the philosopher of, uh, uh, for, of the New York Yankees, when he said it's very difficult to make predictions, especially about the future, and I think Hollywood is in the business. <laughs> Hollywood is in the business of making entertaining predictions about the future of all sorts, and, and I think they're amusing. And, and but my 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 guess is that uh, there is nobody here today that can really imagine what's really going to happen. And, and just to give you an example of that, so to convince you that we're, we're, our imagination isn't strong enough. 1990, when the internet went commercial, do you remember? Could you have imagined the influence that the, that the internet has today on every aspect of your life? Every, you know, the, the, the way that you go online, uh, the way that uh, you do social media, the way that you're communication with your friends and so forth. We're living in a different world and we could not have imagined it back then because you introduce a new technology and the implications are ones that are just too complex for anybody to understand. So that's my, my I, I'm glad that Hollywood is interested in, in, in AI, but my, th my, th my, my guess is that their, 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 their approach is basically uh, simply looking at the, 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 something that will make a good movie. Um, apologies to, to those of you who didn't get a chance to ask your question, but we really are out of time now. So it just remains for me to thank Terry for a really wonderful and fascinating talk. Terry, I wanted to say that at one point uh, when you were talking about AlphaGo, you, you, you uh, mentioned that, that Lisa Dahl had managed to win one match and you said uh, he, he held up the honor of human intelligence. And my thought at the time, well, Terry's doing a pretty good job of that too. <laughs> I think it's going to be a long time before we have a, a machine here doing the kind of thing that you've just done for us. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.